All right, so now let's figure out how it is that the electrical activity of brain cells can represent anything in the world. First of all, let's define our terms. So to represent, we'll say that that means to stand for, symbolize, depict, or portray. This would be what you would find in a typical dictionary. So one of the main tasks of brains is to represent the state of the organism and the world. So the idea is that activity in the auditory nerve is going to be representing sound in the environment, right? Vibrations of air in the environment. Activity in the touch sensitive nerves will represent stimulation of, on the skin. And activity in the optic nerve will represent light in the environment. So in that way, the different sensory pathways are representing different aspects of the environment. Here we see uh, the three sensory pathways coming in. Right here's the world, and so light will activate cells in the retina. They will generate electrical signals, which are sent down the axon. There's a synapse in the thalamus. The thalamus is sort of deep within the brain. It's more than a relay station, but we'll just think of it as a, a relay uh, station for now. Uh, synapse here, chemicals released, target cell activated. Action potentials race on up to area 17 for vision. For touch, we have sensory cells in our skin, and when they're stimulated, they send action potential potentials up to thalamus, from thalamus up to area 312, somatosensory cortex. And in our ear, the cochlear nerve is sending action potentials up to the thalamus, and from thalamus to area 41. So activity in these nerves, then, is representing aspects of the world. But of course, every representation is uh, not accurate in some way. Uh, and in fact, there are two ways that a representation can fall short of accuracy. It can fail to represent something that it is in the, that is in the world, or it can uh, represent something that is not in the world. So, for example, this picture here, this painting, is a representation of some event in World War II. Uh, and we see fire and boats and planes and so on. Um, so those aspects of the event are represented, but the smell and the sound of the event are not represented by the painting. In addition, this painting here has paint. Um, but there wasn't paint in the water, for example. So it's, it's adding something that wasn't in reality. Now, how do neurons then represent the world? Well, there are two strategies that we'll take a look at here. One's called place coding, where the pattern of neuron activity can carry information about what type of stimulus is present or where it is. And then the second kind is called frequency coding the frequency of electrical signals, action potentials, in a given neuron can carry information about how intense the stimulus is. Let's take a look at place coding. Let's imagine the retina here. So this let the sheet be the retina. Um, and at a certain region of the retina where there's a high concentration of cones, we have good acuity called the fovea. Uh, if light hits other parts of the retina, this would be what we would call our peripheral uh, vision. So this is the peripheral part of the retina. Now when you look at how the optic nerve uh, relays information up to the visual cortex, axons from uh, retinal cells in the fovea, they project to the posterior part of area 17. But retinal cells in the peripheral part of the retina, send axons to the anterior part of area 17. And so there's a mapping that the activity of cells in area 17 is correlated to activity uh, in, of the retinal inputs in such a way that there's a preservation of the spatial layout of the activity. In other words, cells here, when they're active, that represents activity on the fovea. 
when cells over here in the visual cortex are act active, that means there's activity in the peripheral part of the retina. So we can think of this as kind of a one-to-one -one mapping relationship. The visual cortex is a kind of map of the retina. I want to take a moment here just to discuss briefly. We mentioned before that the visual cortex has cells that respond to edges. I wanted to show you how neurobiologists model that. Now disregard the cat for a second. Let's take a look at this sheet here. Let this be the retina. So we've got retinal cells that are that are going to generate little electrical signals when light hits them, right? They send axons or the optic this would this bundle of nerve fibers would be the optic nerve. So the retinal cells themselves, but there are other cells in the retina that end up sending the output signals from the retina to the thalamus. You got the synapse in the thalamus. So here are your thalamus cells. Thalamus cells send axons up to visual cortex. So here are some visual cortex cells, and then here are some other cells in visual cortex. These green cells are going to be what we call the edge detectors, or the orientation cells. Now if you look at the, the way this is mapped out, we're going to find out that this cell down here responds only when there is a vertical edge projected onto the retina. And this cell will respond only when there is a diagonal edge projected onto the retina. Let's take a look at the vertical one. Here's why. If we trace back its inputs, we'll see a pattern. Let's take this red one first. Here's the input going backwards. Now that's to this thalamus cell, and that's to this retinal cell. Take the second input back here to the middle cell in the thalamus, middle cell in the retina. Third input, trace it back. Top cell in the thalamus, top cell in the retina this means is, is that this cell, this green uh, vertical edge detector, only becomes active when all three uh, of its synapses are simultaneously active. So all three have to be releasing neurotransmitters, opening up channels, ions going in, and then that'll reach threshold, and then it'll become active. It'll send, generate its action potential. But the condition in which all three synapses are simultaneously active would be the condition in which all three of the retinal cells would be active. And that would be when there is a vertical edge uh, being detected. Right? So an edge of light or darkness uh, can activate these cells and you'll get uh, activity in this cell, but not that cell. And if you follow the wiring for this cell, Again, under the condition that all three of its inputs have to be active simultaneously for it to generate an action potential, then you'll find that occurs when there's a diagonal bar, diagonal edge, diagonal uh, band of light hitting the retina. So we would call these edge detectors, and they become edge detectors because of the wiring between the retina, the thalamus, and the cortex. This is one of the early stages in visual processing breaking down the visual world into edges of various orientations. So we've got vertical cell detectors, uh, we've got horizontal cell detectors, we've got diagonals of every angle, we've got populations of cells that are responding to different edges of different orientations in the world. Now it turns out that in some of the early research on the visual system they would fi fix uh, little goggles to kittens and alter their visual experience. So for example, imagine you put goggles on that only had like a, a horizontal grating pattern. So the kitten could not see anything else outside the world. All it saw was is sort of a horizontal band of edges. And when those kittens grew up and they recorded from activity in the visual cortex, what they found was they did not have very many uh, vertical edge detectors at all. Many of the cells in the cortex were horizontal edge detectors, but the vertical edge detectors were significantly reduced, and it showed up in the cat's visual perception because the cat would run around and it would bump into the legs of tables and chairs. In other words, it was as if it could not detect, it could not see vertical edges because the early visual experience altered the wiring of the visual cortex, uh, shifting the population of visual cortical cells here to be most uh, sensitive to horizontal uh, edges 
and to fail to develop a population of cells that could detect vertical edges. To reinforce this idea of um, place coding, let's take a look now at a more complicated diagram, but it'll give you the idea. So here we have the retina again, so a two-dimensional sheet of light-sensitive cells. Here's our thalamus, LGN, lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and here's our V1, or area 17, primary visual cortex. Uh, we've got some objects in the world, object one and two, and the idea is, is that the uh, object number, object two, let's say, is hitting this, this part of the retina here, right? Well, uh, because there's a mapping, there's a one-to-one -one mapping of the thalamus and the visual cortex, object two is going to be activating cells in this particular region of the uh, visual cortex. Object one, at a different location, right, in terms of retinal activity, is going to be activating a different population of cells. So this is an example of place coding because the activity of cells in the cortex is dependent upon the activity of um, the, the position or the placement of cells in the retina. Right? So activity here in this location will activate this population of cells. Let's say it's a horizontal edge. Okay, it's going to activate horizontal edge detectors at this location, but there are horizontal edge detectors at this location as well, but they would only be active if there was a horizontal edge at position number one. So again, there the, the V1, or area 17, is preserving spatial relations. Populations of cells in certain areas here are representing activity in certain areas of the retina and not others. These cells up here are representing activity in this area of the retina and not other areas of the retina. And just to recap down here, how is it that cells can be edge detectors? Again, there's a convergence of these uh, 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 cells onto one common cell. And uh, so that cell only becomes active when all three inputs are simultaneously active. And that condition is met, met when you have uh, a, a horizontal bar of light, for example. So the visual cortex, we can think of it as a map of the surface of the retina, just as somatosensory cortex is a map of the surface of the skin. But let's go to a different sense, and that is hearing. So here, over here on the left, we have the eardrum, and of course the eardrum will vibrate whenever air vibrations hit it. We've got uh, our three little bones in the ear there, and those bones will uh, cause this little uh, membrane to vibrate. This is the oval window. And so when the eardrum vibrates, the bones transmit that vibration to the oval window, and that makes the oval window vibrate. And this would be the inner ear. There's a membrane and on the surface of the membrane are hair cells distributed along the length of the membrane. And these hair cells and the membrane is surrounded by fluid. So when this little oval window vibrates, the uh, little, little waves are set up in the fluid and these hair cells will, will bend according to the, the waves set up in the fluid. Um, now an example of place coding then is the following that cells that are closest to the oval window, uh, they respond to high frequencies. So, so when the uh, sound coming in here has some high frequencies, the nature of the waves set up in this uh, fluid here is such that these cells respond to those high frequency waves. But these cells do not respond to high frequency waves. Rather, cells further down the basilar membrane here, they respond to lower frequency waves that are set up in the fluid. So in this case then we have place coding because the placement of these sensory cells is coding for or representing the frequency of the vibration out in the world. When these cells are active it represents high frequency vibrations in the world. When these cells are active it represents low frequency vibrations out in the world. Uh, here's a, another diagram illustrating this idea of place coding in the, in the ear. So we've got the ha hair cells, and again, when these cells are active, high frequency uh, 
uh, representation when these cells low frequency. Uh, another example of place coding is the skin again. So again, um, activity here will activate certain cells in the somatosensory cortex. Neighboring cells will receive inputs from corresponding neighboring positions on the skin. So there's a map of the skin in the somatosensory cortex. There's a map of the, the frequency uh, inputs of the world in auditory cortex. And there's a map of the uh, retina in the visual cortex. The final type of coding or the second type of coding was frequency coding. So we had place coding and now frequency coding. And frequency coding works in the following way. Remember that uh, neurons generate action potentials. Well, we can uh, measure the frequency of those action potentials. And neurons can generate higher frequency action potentials when the stimulus, when the input stimulus, is greater intensity. So the idea is, is that if this is a sensory neuron and it's generating low frequency electrical signals, then the input to that neuron could represent a soft sound, for example, or a soft touch or a dim light. Uh, on the other hand, if this sensory neuron is generating high frequency action potentials, that would represent a loud sound if it were in the auditory nerve, a hard touch if it was uh, the tactile system, or a bright light if it were in the optic nerve. Right. So neurons are adjusting the frequency of their electrical si signals based on the intensity of the input. Now remember, these are the, the types of sensory neurons uh, that are transforming something in the world into electrical signals. But this is similar to that idea, get that other picture, of, where was that? Similar to the idea here. Uh, where the magnitude, the intensity of the release of transmitter is correlated to the frequency of output signals by the neuron. So when you don't have many transmitters released, you might get no electrical activity at all in the target cell. Uh, some medium amount of transmitters released, you get low frequency signals. Lots of transmitters released, you get high frequency signals. Same idea with sensory neurons, S low intensity, stimulus from the world, you're going to get low frequency action potentials. High intensity stimulus from the world, high intense or high frequency action potentials. Depending on what neural pathway it's in, it's going to represent sound, touch, light, etc.